Mr. Dennis has signed and uh, <coughs> in, indicated the uh, the occasion. In fact, the, the text definitely says it was that when uh, he awoke uh, and he knew what had been done to him by his, his younger son that he, uh, he proceeded to express himself here. And that connection itself tells right away that although there are going to be lessons that are introduced uh, along the way, that in the first instance and primarily, uh, this is another curse, just as Genesis 3.15, uh, that the gospel got included along uh, the way before the curse was uh, over. Uh, and, uh, and so here, it, and, and that was primarily a curse, and, and so in this case, uh, likewise. So he begins with a, a, a curse, the curse of Ham Canaan. And this idea that it is preeminently uh, a, a curse uh, also comes out of the fact that after each blessing, the curse is repeated. He will be a servant for the his brothers. And uh, yet here we have this, this uh, prophecy, which is uh, uh, we look at and, and, and uh, we are particularly interested in, in uh, this development in redemptive history. Now, in terms of the, uh, uh, the scope of Genesis 3 and Genesis 9, he, he chooses Panorama, he takes us down to the Messianic age. Genesis 3 does so uh, without paying a, a lot of attention to in, in between the beginning and, and the actual coming of Christ, whereas Genesis 9 uh, it is more concerned with, with developments in the pre-Messianic age itself. It includes the Messianic, uh, but what it is prophesying, especially in terms of the relationship of, uh, of Canaan and, uh, and Shem, what it is prophesying is something which is uh, realized in, in the Old Testament history of, of Israel and, and their holy war uh, against Canaan. So, but again, you see, it's that, that military imagery basic to this one, just as it was uh, uh, basic to the Genesis 3 passage. So knowing what, what the, this uh, youngest son has done, he uh, pronounces uh, the, the uh, curse upon him. Let's look at the, the verse uh, uh, verse 25, my Yomer, and he said, uh, now instead of Arur Ata, curse it, I use Satan, it's Arur Kina'an. And as we said, in, in this case, the particular branch of the line of Ham in which this uh, curse would uh, be uh, carried out is uh, indicated here, namely in, in, uh, in, in Canaan, whereas in the case of Shem and uh, Jacob, uh, it not, it's not so. One reason, whatever other reason there, uh, there might be, one reason uh, possibly that Canaan is, is selected here was that, that uh, it uh, provided a, a pun and puns there are. In, in, in each case, the, the name of the individual is, is played upon uh, in a, in a wordplay, in a pun, in order to declare the, the, the blessing or the, the curse. Now, out of Tina'an, there, there was the, the ready idea uh, of, of subjugation involved in the, in the verb kana, 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 which means to subjugate. So perhaps, as I, as I say, the, the substitution of Canaan for Ham was that Canaan lent itself more readily to this obvious uh, pun, uh, which brings out what the curse was. He was going to be subjugated. He was going to be overcome in, in battle, just as uh, just as uh, Satan was, just uh, to be uh, crawling in, in, in the dust and, and subdued unto death. Uh, so it was going to be here with with uh, Ham Canaan, as I say. Each of the other cases where we are going to. Uh, find that there is a pun involved. So, Arur Atta. Uh, and then the, the curse is, has to do with the things of God's kingdom and it amounts to reprobation, actually. It's a declaration of, uh, of a reprobation here, uh, which is expressed in the language of being a servant of servants. You will be to your brethren and you can't divorce Genesis 9 here from the, the subsequent similar imagery that is used uh, in making the distinction between the elect and reprobate lines of, of Jacob and uh, Esau, the twin brothers, which involve the, the elder brother being set aside and giving place uh, 
uh, in God's kingdom uh, to the uh, younger brother, and that too was that the, the elder will serve the younger. And in, in that prophecy about uh, Esau, uh, there was a, a big declaration of uh, his, his repudiation. He was within the covenant community, but uh, he, he would be cut off from it. He would be removed. The, the future, the election, the remnant um, belonged to the, the younger brother. The elder will serve the younger. Is, uh, is then the same kind of language as we have here in, in, in Genesis uh, 9. In both cases, by the way, that, that strange phenomenon that keeps reminding us so that covenant is a bigger circle than, than, than the election. And, and, um, so it, 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 here again, in the post-flood situation, they were all within the ark. They all experienced the uh, salvation, uh, but the uh, child of the devil, huh? uh, Ham, is their covenant child, although he, he, he uh, was. So the, there is a, the, the first feature of this, uh, the first, this exclusion from the, the covenant that will, uh, uh, this rejection, this dispossession uh, of, of covenantal inheritance is uh, what is uh, predicted. And, and uh, as I say, the, the, the verb kanaf means to subjugate, and God's uh, Commanding Israel to proceed against the Canaanites. Uh, this is the verb that, that is uh, used for several times in the, in the description of the actual execution of, uh, of, of the uh, holy war against the king. We talked to this uh, the verb. So uh, the, the, the immediate uh, development in view here was within the Old Testament the period in, in, in its, itself that, uh, that encountered. Israel and uh, Canaan. Well, then he, he goes on to the blessing on, on Shem, and uh, it is in the form, uh, and again, of a passive participle. Instead of our roar, you have Baruch. So, blessed be Yahweh, Elohe, Shem, God of, of Shem. Overall, the pattern of this uh, is with the uh, the covenant line in the, the middle, the Abrahamic line in the middle. And we think of what God said to Abraham in that covenant with him, uh, that uh, the, 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 those who assume the, the favorable attitude toward the you, I will bless, and then those who are hostile and curse you, I, I will curse. So the Abrahamic line stands in the middle because on the one side the curse of those who would curse the Abrahamites and on the other side the Japhethites and receiving a blessing as those who would bless the Abrahamites. So Baruch Yahweh, a doxology actually, not a benediction. Uh, we come to Japheth, the, the, the benediction, uh, a blessing on the person, but the, here it is uh, is blessed be Yahweh, not blessed be Shem, but blessed be Yahweh. And uh, so it is a, a benediction, which is to say that that's, that's so great is, is this blessing. So great is this blessing. The whole heart of redemptive history and all that's involved, but that immediately you, you soar beyond the benediction to the praise of the God who, who provides uh, uh, this uh, satiric blessing. So blessed be the Lord. And now the Lord is described in terms of his relationship to Shem as being the God of Shem. And there's the benediction. Huh? There's the blessing on Shem that God identifies with him. What greater blessing, huh? That's the covenant blessing where this community of, that is blessed, the Semite community, uh, takes on the character of the people of God so that God is willing to be called the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the <coughs> people in Israel, that that's their, their blessing, that God's name is identified with them, that they are the community that are, as Genesis 4.26 put it in the earlier period, uh, the, the Sethite community were those who were calling on the name of God, who were being surnamed after him because he gave them his name, who were calling on, on him uh, for help because uh, he was uh, their, their father. And uh, so here now, blessed be the Lord, who is the God of, 
of Shem, pun again, shame. The blessing is that they bear the name of God, and that's what shame means is his name. And so it just as Kina'an indicated something they should Shem, shame, indicates name in the specific sense of, of the, the name of, of God himself. And so it will be the, the destiny of these Semites, and of course th this particular promise too that however far it extends, and I would say this one extends right into the New Testament age, but however far it extends, the beginning point is with Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, uh, which is uh, described a couple chapters after this. So the, the Abrahamic covenant, it was in that covenant, and uh, especially <coughs> the Semites became the particular recipients of, of the name of God, so that their future was to bear the name of God uh, in the form of, of the inscripturated word of God, which reveals his name, and in the form of the Messiah, the Lord God, who is the incarnate word of God. That was uh, to be uh, their destiny. Now you're familiar with the fact then that not liking the the, the thought of <clears throat> having a doxology here rather than a benediction, uh, suggestions have been made to repoint the uh, text here uh, so that it would uh, be reading uh, not Baruch Yahweh but Baruch Yahweh, not blessed be the Yahweh but blessed of Yahweh. Blessed by Yahweh, once Shem to be the, the subject of the, the, the blessing. And so it uses the, the construct form by pointing at the roof, blessed of Yahweh, blessed by Yahweh. <coughs> and then to carry through that thought consistently requires uh, one other change in the text. Instead of LOK construct state, Shem, the God of Shem, the, the uh, LOK. The, and so the, the, the translation as a result of those two changes, Baruch instead of Baruch, and uh, Elohai instead of Elohai, the translation then would become, blessed by the Lord my God, be Shem. So Shem then turns out to be the subject of, of the, the blessing. No need for the, this juggling of, it, of the text whatsoever as it stands. It's, we get the, 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 the main point, and it's a, and a benediction it's instead of a and, and instead of a um, uh, it's a doxology rather <coughs> instead of a benediction. Now, when the fulfillment takes place, or shortly thereafter, so God comes and makes covenant with Abraham. That, that's the fulfillment of, of this, and then a chapter or so later, in Genesis 14:13, this oracle of Noah is virtually quoted uh, in the encounter between Abraham, who God is based on him, and Melchizedek, where Melchizedek, then dealing with Abraham, pronounces uh, the, this language of, of, uh, of, of blessing upon Abraham, and uh, in, in included in, in one of the formulations there in Genesis 14 is the doxology of uh, uh, the form of, of, of Genesis 9, Blessed be the Lord uh, is a language that Melchizedek implies. So there, it's, it's, there are enough within a few chapters of uh, where the fulfillment of this blessing begins to take place, begins to take place. All right, because this covenant uh, then made with the, the line of, uh, of Shem in terms, you know, and, and meanwhile, between Genesis 9 and, and Genesis 14, So the blessing clearly, we know in terms of the Abrahamic covenant, 
the blessing with inclusion within the kingdom, the appointment to be the heirs indeed of, of the kingdom. And uh, as, as we know, that kingdom, uh, that's a, an Old Testament typological form, also has a, a, a New Testament form. Now it's in, it's in connection with receiving the typological kingdom that there's a very close connection between the, the blessing on Shem and, and the curse on, on Canaan. These two things are correlative. Uh, the Abrahamites, the Semites of the Abrahamite line, receive the blessing of the kingdom by dispossessing, by carrying out the subjugation, kana, the mandate uh, against the, the uh, against the Canaanite line. So there's a sort of a, a center of gravity of, of this particular promise, I think, within the pre-Messianic age already in, in uh, that holy war against Canaan. Center of gravity, but not the total message. And so we are justified then, I think, including this passage in a survey of Messianic prophecies because, you know, for one thing, that this blessing on Shem involves the new covenant age and, in fact, among you know, the promised seed of Abraham, uh, the, the, the promised the individual, again, the corporate individual thing, uh, the corporate ones are going to be winning that battle and yet the, the individual one is going to come along and win the, the final decisive battle for Genesis Genesis 3 and also for uh, uh, Genesis 9. Well, and Canaan will be a servant of servants to them. So in, in terms of in terms of, of that particular outstanding episode in Old Testament history, there is a rejection of the Canaanites and, and there is a, a, a blessing of the, the Abrahamites. One other general uh, observation we should make, we did make the observation that in each case, you have to take the genealogy seriously. There is an actual genealogical connection then between you know, the Canaanites, get this curse, and and the uh, uh, and Ham, and yet we must qualify that by saying that this doesn't mean uh, that that all descendants of Ham or, or Canaan are cursed. No, it's rather that some significant, outstanding development will take place within that line, which expresses curse or blessing, but it doesn't mean that all Hamites are cursed, it doesn't mean that all Kingites are cursed. And contrary-wise, it doesn't mean that because there is a big blessing on the Abrahamite line of Shem, it doesn't mean that all, uh, obviously not all Semites are, unless there were other lines uh, altogether all from, from Abraham. And within the Abrahamic community, this is true, that the covenant is, is broader than the election. Not all Semites, not Abrahamites, uh, are guaranteed this, this kind of uh, blessing. There will be the, the seed of the serpent, and there will be the Ham Canaan type characters, and the, the, the Ishmael Esau type characters. They are not all Israel, who are of Israel characters within, uh, within the, the covenant. And likewise, then, with uh, the, the blessing on Japheth, there will be an outstanding fulfillment of whatever that blessing is, we'll see, uh, in the among the descendants of Japheth, particularly then among the, the Greeks who traced themselves uh, through uh, Helen and Prometheus and the opposite to through Japheth, there will be a, a specific fulfillment uh, there, but it doesn't mean that all descendants of Japheth obviously are going to be blessed. So uh, let's keep that in mind now as we go to the the, uh, the final line, which is the Yacht Elohim the Yephet pun once again, which you can hear if you just listen to the text, Yacht Yepheth. So there's a play on the name uh, Japheth, Yepheth, uh, that involves use of the verb pata, page tau eight. The rare verb, and uh, so right away the problem of, of translating it, it hits us. And uh, I, I suspect that just as with the case of uh, Canaan, that that name was chosen in order to facilitate a pun using the verb kana. So I think in this case, uh, the verb pata, ending in a he, was chosen with the idea, especially to open, instead of the usual verb to open, which would be pata, in a he. And, and I think then the pata uh, with a he was opted for because it would lend itself uh, to a pun in the name Jacob, where if you use pata with a he, you wouldn't get the, uh, the, the wordplay 
uh, anymore. So we, we have this verb pata, and uh, it doesn't appear all that often. One place where it appears is in the opening of the eyes or the opening of, of the mouth. And uh, the more common translation, I think, in the versions is something like the enlarged and expand. So that uh, you would end up with, with, the, with the latter translation, and may God May God enlarge it uh, to Japheth. May God en en enlarge it to, uh, to Japheth. Whereas on the rendering that I, I, I'm just suggesting is that we have a, an alternative for the faith, with a faith being used uh, and with that meaning of, 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 of to open uh, the eyes, ears, mouth, whatever. And, and, but in this case, what's, what's going to be open? What does that mean, may God open it? usual translation that you know right away you have some sense that God expand and Jacob and then you can try to figure out in what sense is God like to expand uh, and Jacob but on the rendering to open uh, we have to look someplace else uh, or beyond we have to look to the next clause in order to find what it is that's going to be open now in the next clause and by the way this then is characteristic of Hebrew uh, in the one half of the line that's expressed so much and then you get the, the filling out of the, the, the image in, in the second half. And the second half of the, the line, uh, or at least the second third of this line, is Vayishkon Bahale Shem. Now there, there is the object in the tense of Shem. And the full picture then becomes, may God open wide the tense of Shem so that he, Japheth, that, well, 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 may God open wide the tents of Shem for Japheth, so that Japheth may dwell within those tents. Now that, I take it, is, is the imagery that is demanded by the context. Uh, what was the occasion? The occasion was that the Lord was found, Japheth, they get struck in the tent. And uh, we are told about these two sons, Shem and Japheth, that they performed an act of really a piety of love which covers over about the two sins. They're covering over their father's name. Where did that happen? That happened in the tent. It was within the tent that jointly they performed this uh, godly act. And therefore, the reward which would come to them together just as their act of uh, piety and uh, love was performed together. And so they will also share in the reward and they will share together in the tent as, as the place of reward. So uh, everything ties them together, uh, uh, this understanding of it, to which we'll come back and try to trace some uh, developments of it in Isaiah and, and, and so on. But uh, meanwhile, let's also notice another approach to, uh, uh, to this. Uh, it says, and may God enlarge Japheth. Then very often, De defying the hermeneutical principle I tried to establish at the beginning, that this all has to do with inclusion or exclusion from the kingdom of God. Uh, some take this as describing the general geographical political spread of the descendants of Jacob, uh, which would be traced uh, in the, the, the surrounding genealogies, which show that as a matter of fact, the descendants of Jacob very rather uh, far from the community of nations uh, across the northern part of the Crescent and a lot of are brought from there, and, and that is thought then to be all that is uh, being promised by way of blessing to Japheth, and, and moreover, that a contrast is actually being set up uh, between these uh, general common grace blessings uh, of uh, Japheth as over against the spiritual blessings which are being predicated to this alleged of Shem, and you get that in this way may, may God, Elohim, uh, a general name for, for God, huh? uh, instead of the covenant name, it, it is observed, huh? may God, the general God of the nations, uh, enlarge Jacob in terms of things earthly and physical and so on. But may he and he dwell, and, and now the unspecified subject of Wayishkon to dwell is uh, suggested to be not Jacob, but God, hmm? uh, by way of contrast. May God enlarge Jacob, but may he, God himself, dwell within the tents of, of, of Shem. May there be an intimate covenant relationship with Shem and, and just this more, more general uh, attitude of blessing for Jacob. I can't buy that at all. And as I say, the whole 
context cries out uh, for a, a joint fellowship in reward for Jacob uh, with uh, Hashem. And uh, the, uh, that fits better the whole uh, uh, flow, I think, of, of the language. May, may Elohim, and, and mind you, Elohim, yes, it's the general name for God, but Elohim has just been described in the preceding uh, line as the God of Shem. He, he is Yahweh. Yahweh is the God of Shem. So just to describe him as Elohim doesn't disconnect, doesn't disconnect him from Yahweh, but it's a, it should be understood as, as just another way of saying the Yahweh, the God of Shem. So may Yahweh Elohim, huh? may, may the living God, who is the God of creation under the covenant, may, may, may he open it wide for Japheth, so that Japheth can enter into those covenant tents. So from uh, the blessing of Abraham, as we said, uh, the, the center of gravity of that the blessing takes place within the pre-Messianic age. Within the pre-Messianic age, Shem, the Semites, particularly Abrahamites, Israel, they are the ones who occupy the covenant tent. They are the people of the national election who dwell within the typological kingdom and so on. But a new day was coming. There was the coming of the Gentiles. And in, in, in when this prophecy is elaborated a few chapters later on, when you come to the day of heaven and so on, we are reading, of course, about all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed in that individual seed of the woman, seed, seed of uh, uh, Abraham. And uh, that, that blessing of universalism in the Messianic age is anticipated here in this oracle on uh, on Jacob, and so we get more continuity in the development of these messianic uh, passages at, at this particular uh, point. And uh, so the thought then is of the opening out, of the, the spreading of the, of the covenant the order under the new covenant, so as uh, to accommodate the Gentiles. Only here it's not quite that broad. Gentiles, that's Genesis 12, in those terms, but it already is pointing in, in that direction only somewhat more specifically in terms of the descendants of, of uh, Jacob. And, uh, and and once again, in, uh, in this case, as in the case of the blessing on Shem, uh, there's a contrast. But here, here's an election, uh, here's an inclusion within uh, the holy redemptive kingdom that's uh, going to characterize the line of Jacob uh, in contrast to that as the rejection of of the, the, the Canaan. Now, the specifics of this then are, are what I think is interesting. Where uh, specifically does this take place in history? In, in general, of course, it's the it's the New Covenant age. And as I say, we want to look at a passage or two in Isaiah in, in a moment. But uh, in, in particular, I, I would see that this this prophecy is fulfilled in the Pauline mission of all things. Right? So Paul comes uh, as the proclaimer of, of the New Covenant. Journey, he takes himself into the area which was indeed occupied by these Jacobites. Yes, it is true that the, they occupied that territory far to the east and, and, and the west above the perfect crescent of Canaan, including over into Macedonia and Greece and so on. And in fact, then the Greeks, as I pointed out a moment ago, in, in their own understanding of, of their backgrounds, you trace them back to the figure of, of the opposite, which is clearly the, the shape of the figure here. So the Greeks are, are descendants of Japheth, and at the call of, of the vision of the man of Macedonia, Paul finds himself in his missionary trust moving in, in that direction, and, and much of his ministry then is being performed in, in terms of ministry to these particular descendants of, of Japheth. And moreover, when when he returns from his missionary journey and he's uh, giving this verbal uh, report, uh, it seems that he, he uses the very imagery here of the open tent, the open door to the entrance, when he, uh, he tells them there's the joy how God has opened the wide door of opportunity for us to hear among these people who are the of Jacob. So I, I think we actually see a, a trajectory of this image from, uh, from Genesis 9 imagery of, of the open tent accommodating the incoming of, of the non-spitting believers 
a trajectory that that starts here in Genesis 9 and is picked up in the book of Acts and, and, and Paul's own and it's representations concerning his, his own ministry. But then uh, uh, mid midway along that trajectory between uh, Noah and, and Paul is Isaiah. And we want to now I'm looking at a passage here where uh, this basic early programmatic prophecy is, is picked up. And let's see, Isaiah 54. Uh, maybe we can look at that. Let's look at the Hebrew and that maybe afterwards we can just take a pass to look at, um, at uh, Isaiah 49. Isaiah 54. Okay. Starts out with an imperative to the uh, Rani. Rani. Sing. Huh? Sing, O desolate one who has not born children. Break into song. Shout aloud, you who have not uh, travailed in pain with to bring forth children. So, so here's someone that, that has been desolate, has not had children, and, and yet she's encouraged to, to sing. And why? Because of, of, of the, the future. Now, what to do is uh, this whole testament to speak. Promise is given to Abraham. A fulfillment in terms of the Mosaic Covenant a covenant which projects a second level with a typological kingdom and a national election and a principle of works. So yeah, it begins with a wonderful fulfillment of, of the promise that they will be the overcomers and they will conquer the Canaanites and dispossess them. And nevertheless, then, when by grace they have received the, the kingdom, they are placed under a principle of works to hang on to uh, that kingdom, and then they fail. And uh, along the way, the exile takes place, and uh, there was the married woman up to that point, huh? The covenant community was as the, the, the married woman enjoying the, the covenant status, but then she becomes desolate in terms of the exile. She's the desolate, she's devoid of it all of the blessedness and the benefits of uh, the, the, the covenant, the theocratic land in, in her exile. She's without all of these things. She's without children. Her children have been slain and carried away. And uh, now Isaiah, looking at, ahead to that stage of affairs, when the people of God find themselves as no longer the, the married, no longer God's people, blow on me, and, uh, no longer God's wife, no longer his people, just desolate. Nevertheless, at that point, they are being called upon to rejoice because there's a new day coming beyond beyond the fall of Israel, beyond this whole development. The seed of the woman is, is coming. The seed of Abraham is, is coming. That descendant of, of Shem, and he will introduce a new day in, in which open the doors wide now because people from all over are going to be coming in and swelling the ranks. There will only be a remnant a remnant of the Jews, but they will be, their ranks will be swelled by the incoming of the Jacobites and, and of other Gentiles. That's what's in view here. So sing. Huh? This is the future. In spite of the, in spite of the present desolation, the old covenant community, nevertheless, there's a bigger future than there has been blessedness in, 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 even in the, in the past. And in your desolate state, huh? the desolate state upon which the new covenant dies, and there will be greater blessing than you had while you were married uh, in, in terms of the mosaic arrangement. So that's the picture. Sing then. And why? Because ki rabim, more are the ne shomei ma. More are the children of your desolate, of, of this tail end of the story. 
and the fall gives way to the fullness, more are the children of your desolation than the sons of, of the married woman. Or, or more are the children of the desolate one huh? than the <coughs> children of the married woman, says the Lord. And so what should you be doing now? And here again now we get the image of the tent picked up from Genesis 9. This incoming of the Gentiles is uh, described in terms of a bigger tent to accommodate them. Uh, and, and it's in the form of a commandment. So enlarge, makom ahalek, there's the word for tent again. Enlarge this covenant uh, tent place. And uh, the curtains of your, your dwelling, the curtains of your tent, yatu, from the verb data, extend them. Don't hold back. Don't be stingy about this. Uh, the, the future is going to be overwhelming, and, and, and you must be, be ready for it with a large enough uh, uh, dwelling place. And then the details of that image are carried on when they're told uh, uh, then to make wide uh, the uh, lengthen the cords and and, and, uh, and and strengthen the stakes. Why? Well, because verse three on the right hand and the left hand you will be scattered abroad. Just in the, in the break, uh, somewhere up here asking, I don't know if your text is the same as mine, but mine has the, the word, you will be scattered abroad, uh, just below the word for left, and, and with a uh, you know, mark beside it, you all have that kind of thing. And, and so whenever you have that, what follows uh, this is either is that at the end of the preceding line, or at the end of the following line, and you have to determine from the context which it is. In this particular case, uh, this goes with the end of the preceding line. So, for on the right hand and on the left, you are going to be scattered abroad, and your seed, the nations will take possession of. So there you get your Israel against Canaan, holy war, take possession of, dispossessed language. And your seed are going to possess not just Canaan, and, and in some typological kingdom form, but your, your seed is going to possess all, all of the nations by way of of uh, the Gentiles being incorporated with the, with the believing Jews to, to make up uh, the kingdom of, of Christ. So uh, your seed will dispossess or possess the nations and, and the desolate cities uh, you will occupy. So there, there Isaiah, I think, clearly has uh, Genesis 9 in, in view, both in terms of the particular meaning of the prophecy, the incoming inclusion of of uh, the Gentiles, and also in terms of the specific uh, imagery of uh, the, the open tent to uh, accommodate them. Uh, just quickly, another such passage of elaborating it even more is uh, Isaiah 49. Uh, so what you have here, is, 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 and, and by the way, notice the context. This, this was Isaiah 54. Right after Isaiah 53, right after the servant of the Lord dies, so this is this is the, the natural outcome that you would expect as a result of the ministry of the servant of, of the Lord. And, 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 and it is the coming in of, of uh, the Gentiles, the new covenant. And likewise, back in Genesis, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 49, another one of the uh, so-called uh, songs of the servant of, of the Lord in Isaiah is uh, in chapter 49. And as you read along in, in that, well, uh, he's the one, the servant is, who is the bring Jacob back to the Lord and so on. And I'm especially interested in uh, verse 6 and following, for he is the one too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Israel. Uh, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So this same theme we're concerned with in Genesis 9, the blessing on Jacob, is, is uh, in, in you here. And uh, so let's uh, see. But the whole context is, is uh, on target here. Um, now let's pick it up from 19, which ties in perhaps most closely that with, uh, with Isaiah 54. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people. And here's that thought of the grand enlargement. You will be too small for your people, and those who devour you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement, more are the children of the desolate than the children of the of the married, Isaiah 54 said. Here's the same thought. The children born during your bereavement under the new covenant of the Gentiles coming in will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. 
and then you will say, you know, right, who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left all alone, but these, where have they come from? And then uh, this is what the sovereign Lord said. See, I will beckon to the Gentiles. And then you get a very elaborate picture of the Gentiles streaming in uh, back home into the, uh, the old covenant tents. And uh, uh, particularly interesting is uh, the, the closing part of the, this, this chapter, which provides the Old Testament rootage uh, for uh, what our, our Lord says uh, uh, and, uh, and, and providing the, uh, the, the imagery that is resumed in the millennium passage, as a matter of fact, in Revelation 20. So this, this end of Isaiah 49 is a uh, particular interest for, for the whole meaning of, of the Revelation 20 binding of Satan as, as, a, as characteristic of the millennium. Because here, in these closing verses of, uh, of Isaiah 49, you get the, the, the challenge in reflecting how Satan has uh, all, all the world. He's the, the warrior who has uh, all of the, the world held captive. And, and, and what promise can, can there be? Who, who can take away from, from the, the strong man, Satan, and, and those whom he holds captive because he is the one the deceiver of all the nations uh, uh, up until Christ comes and that is. And uh, well, who can challenge it? And then the Lord challenges it. This is what the Lord says, yes captives can be taken. The, the, the question was, can plunder be taken from warriors, captives, rescued from the fierce, and that seems to Satan winning out after all, but, but not so. God says, yes, captives will be taken from the warriors. Plunder will be retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you, and your children I will save, and, and so forth. And Jesus then picks up on that and describes himself as the stronger one who is uh, spoken of here. He, Jesus, he will contend with the strong man, Satan. And uh, the whole context of Jesus' discourse there in terms of uh, also uh, uh, delivering the being possessed them uh, from their bondage and, and bringing them to the light of, of salvation. And so that imagery of Jesus is the stronger one who binds Satan and thus is able to plunder his, his house and so on. And then that is picked up in the imagery of, of, of the millennium, where Satan is again described as the cloud, and it's referring to the same thing. Jesus is referring to what he's doing in terms of his first advent, when he comes with the Savior, and he proceeds to send his people out with the gospel, and, and this is the power of God, of the salvation, and of the deliverance of Satan. And that's the progress of the gospel during this age. Yes, the church is in the wilderness, and it's protected by God so that it is able to fulfill this, this great uh, mission uh, along uh, the way. And, uh, and that's what Revelation 20 is likewise uh, uh, saying that uh, during this church age, which is the millennium, uh, Satan is found so that his character as the deceiver of the nations is no longer there. He, he's lost. It. Christ delivers is elected from all of the nations. And of course, there comes the climax at the end of the millennium when Satan is unbound and he's loosed uh, from his place. And, and that is the, the, the Antichrist crisis uh, that ends the church age and precipitates the second coming of, of Christ and then his decisive uh, setting of affairs. But this whole trajectory then of, of the millennium and back to these passages and uh, back to the Genesis 9 and maybe suggest something of, of to the vast scope of, and the richness of, of this Noahic oracle here, and in particular of um, this uh, word of blessing on, on the Jacobites. So the blessing on Shem certainly takes us down to the Messianic age and the individual figure of the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. The blessing on, on Jacob doesn't uh, have its anticipations within the pre-Messianic age, but it comes in with a rush, huh? under the new covenant and so on. Now then, the next one, let's see in terms of time, how it makes sense in this five minutes to get into the next one, which is Genesis 49. <coughs> I think maybe I'll do something sensible and, and let you start five minutes early preparing for a Hebrew test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is tomorrow. And uh, the first hour, okay, and uh, uh, hopefully I'll be.
be able to reveal upon you. Please turn your papers in when the hour is up so I can get started with a lecture in the second hour. <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll have in, in view a uh, lecture in the second hour, but we'll start with the test. Uh, any questions about it now? It will be translation uh, of a, 